When I was a young girl, I loved to visit a Christian bookstore with my parents. One day I picked up a story and started to read it right there in the store. I sat on the floor and began to read the story of a lady named Mary. My parents bought me the book and it was my first missionary story. And to this day, it's still one of my favorites. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. We are still trying to resolve our problem with the host site, so for those of you who are only listening on podcast apps, you're probably going to get a bunch of episodes all at once, and hopefully really soon. I started this podcast June of 2019 with the episode entitled, Jesus Starts His Church. We are following the story of the church in chronological order from the apostles' teachings and deaths, the writing of the New Testament, the councils, crusades, inquisitions, reformation, traveling to new worlds, scientific discoveries, and mission work. We have covered so much. Let's dive into today's episode. Our children are being taught in school that mission work done in Africa was bad, that as Christians we colonized Africa and forced them to lose their culture, While researching for this podcast, I talked to Christians who live in Nigeria today, and at the end of the podcast, I'm going to read what they had to say about this view of history. But first, let us tell the story of Mary Slusser. In the 15th century, the Portuguese landed in what is today Nigeria. Soon after that came the British and the Dutch. They traded cocoa oil and slaves. We've talked about the slave trade in many episodes in the past especially the three episodes on William Wilberforce. In 1807, British abolished the slave trade. America also passed a law making the importing of slaves illegal, although that law did not come into effect until 1808. In 1833, Britain made slavery illegal entirely. In 1865, America made slavery illegal. The girl in our story today was 18 years old when slavery was made illegal in the United States. She would eventually move to the continent of Africa, where the slave trade was still in full swing, and she would help work towards changing the hearts of the people in Africa. And here is her story. In 1848, a little girl was born. She was part of this change that swept the world. Mary was born in a small harbor city in Scotland. Her life was exceedingly difficult. Her family was extremely poor. Her father was a drunk. Mary's father would work up to 72 hours a week as a shoemaker, but on payday, he would visit a pub and drink his pay away. Mary had six younger siblings that she had to help care for. It was difficult to feed the family when there was no money. One evening, after returning drunk from the pub, Mary's father saw a look of disgust in her face. Filled with anger, he pushed her into the streets and locked the door. When Mary begged to come in, he dropped a bucket of dirty, freezing water over her head, and Mary spent the evening cold, wet, and hiding from wild dogs and gangs. After that horrible night, the family moved to Dundee to try and keep her father away from his drinking. But his drinking had ruined his health, and he died. When Mary was only 11 years old, she lost her father. This meant Mary had to go to work at age 11 at 5 o'clock in the morning. Mary would wake up early, do housework, then go to the factory to work, then go to school, then come home for more housework and caring for her younger siblings. Mary was starting to cause problems in the neighborhood, and one day a lady grabbed her arm and told her that she sinned and that her sins were going to separate her from God forever. That night, Mary kept thinking about her sin. She prayed to God that night, asking him to forgive her. And after that night, everything was different for Mary. Sunday became her favorite day of the week. Her family would all attend church together and sing and hear preaching. One day, a missionary came to speak to the church, and he talked about a place in Africa called Calabar. Calabar was a place missionaries were afraid to enter. People there practiced witchcraft, and there were secret cannibal societies. 
caliber was full of things like human sacrifices and the terrible practice of killing twin babies. Twins were seen as a curse on the tribe, so twins would either be murdered or left alone to starve or be eaten by wild animals. Calabar was also full of diseases like malaria, and there was no proper medicine to care for the sick. As the missionary spoke, the people in the church sat horrified at the stories. But Mary heard God calling her. This is where I want you to go. Those are my people. Go and tell them about me. But Mary was just a young teenager. She couldn't go to Africa, at least not yet. But she decided to start her mission work right there in Dundee. There was an area in her town that was full of gang violence. So Mary persuaded her church to rent a small room in one of the buildings. She began to teach Bible lessons to children in the community. A gang of boys started to scare away the children. So Mary marched right out and faced the gang. They laughed at her and surrounded her. One boy picked up a rock and tied a string to it and began to swing the string around his head as he moved closer and closer to Mary. The other boys cheered him on, but Mary refused to move. The rock hit her in the head and blood ran down her face. Mary still refused to move. The boy dropped his rock and all the boys began to cheer. Mary was tough. The boys ended up attending her club and each one of them eventually became a Christian. Are you enjoying this podcast? Do you want to support this podcast? Well, pour yourself a cup of coffee and imagine waking up each morning with a reminder from our church fathers. Check out our Etsy page where you can find mugs with quotes from great men and women of God. You'll find a link in the show notes. And now, back to our episode. Mary began attending teaching school. So now she's going to school, working full-time at the factory and running children's club. And then she was promoted in her factory and started to make really good money. This was in 1860. During that decade, the United States had its civil war. Slavery was, of course, the top list for the reason of that war. Canada was also prepping to become an official country. And in Scotland, Mary was attending teacher's school. And while at teacher school, Mary convinced two of her friends to go on a mission field. Those friends would join Hudson Taylor in China. We're going to talk more about Hudson Taylor very shortly. Finally, Mary finished her school and she was allowed to leave for Africa. But her friends at her church told her she shouldn't go to Africa. She should stay in Scotland. I mean, she's making good money and she's running a great mission in the housing units. Mary told them, that they should take over the mission she was running. Her mother and her siblings gave her her blessing to go to Africa. So, in 1876, Mary got in a boat and headed to Africa. Mary rowed on the boat towards Calabar. The others in the boat were shocked to hear that a young lady would be traveling alone to Africa and that she wanted to live in Calabar. But Mary would not go straight to Calabar when she landed in Africa. Mary would move into a small town called Duke Town. It was a little area set up by missionaries. Mary had to live there, learn the language, and prep for the life God had for her in Africa. As Mary saw Africa for the first time, her heart was filled with love. For so many years, people had ridden by boat to steal pieces of land, steal palm oil, steal people, and make them slaves. No one had stopped to love the people. She was not coming to steal, but to bring hope. Duke Town was an exceedingly small town, but Mary loved it right away. That first Sunday, she was shocked to see that the tiny church was completely packed. People from all around came to hear, and the preacher was not a white missionary, but a man named King Io Io. He had been a chief and a warrior. He had been a cannibal but then he had heard about Jesus from the missionary. This man had turned to Jesus and was a changed man. Now he preached in the church in the native language. Mary was going to have to learn this language and many more languages. While Mary was studying the languages, the British forces began to conquer the southern parts of Nigeria. Soldiers were coming out into the tribes and villages were being built by the British houses and roads and schools were being built. Some tribes were okay with the changes. 
but a lot of other tribes fought back against the British. And this made many people in the tribe fearful of the white person. Mary began to work as a teacher. She loved her students and her little school. She would run around barefoot and climb trees. And one day, a group of her friends went into the village and they came across a group of native people who were performing a ritual. Mary opened up her Bible and began to read it to them. And the villagers came and sat down and listened to her speak. As Mary learned more, she began to go deeper into the jungle. She learned that those people living deep in the jungle were not non-religious, lawless people. In fact, they had extremely strict rules of law, and they were very religious. However, their laws and their religions were full of superstition, and a lot of it was harming them rather than helping them. Mary decided she was going to leave Duke Town and move to Old Town. She would not live with other missionaries anymore, but rather move into and live with the people she wanted to reach. Mary was now in her 30s, and living in Old Town was really hard for her. Her home was covered in fleas and lice, and the mosquitoes kept her up at night. There was also the constant drumming and war cries that terrified her. One day, Mary found two women who had been just left to die. She gave them medicine and helped them and brought them back to health. And she taught them about Jesus. The two women received Jesus as their Savior. Then Mary heard that twins in the village had been born. They were going to be left to die. Mary found the twins and brought them to her house. The villagers were shocked. Surely Mary was going to get sick and die or something really horrible would happen to her. Mary would be cursed now. But nothing happened. The twins grew and Mary raised them as her own children. One of the twins, Jamie, would stay with Mary all the way until her death in 1885. The European powers acknowledged British sovereignty over Nigeria. During the Berlin Conference, this meant that the Queen of England now had authority over the Nigerian countries. There is currently, at this time, northern Nigeria and southern Nigeria. This gave the British more authority and they began to build more towns, more roads, and more schools. Meanwhile, Mary had started 12 churches. She traveled to every single one of these churches on Sunday and would preach. And each village where she had a church, it would be completely packed. Each village she worked in, she would also rescue twins that were born. The villages started nicknaming her the White Ma because she had so many children. Miria was now living in Calabar and the tribe was changing and more people were turning to Jesus. One night, Mary heard a noise. She looked up to see a panther inside of her hut. He had a twin in his mouth. Mary grabbed a large stick and attacked the panther. The panther dropped the baby and ran into the jungle. One day, a man arrived from a village called Baca. It was 30 miles away. The village was asking for Mary to come. The chiefs around her warned her, Do not go. These people cannot be trusted. But Mary agreed to go. She left her children in the care of the other villagers in Calabar and then took the 10-hour-long canoe ride. Mary arrived in the village and a crowd had gathered. They gave her honor by giving her a place to live. They gathered the villages around her and the chief told them, Listen to this woman. So Mary began to preach. Over the next four days, Mary told the village about Jesus. She also showed them how to make bandages and properly care for wounds. Many of the villagers turned to Jesus. Then one night, a tornado came. The village was completely destroyed and Mary had to take cover. She could hear hymns being sung by the villagers. How quickly they had changed. They were trusting Jesus. Once the tornado passed, the villagers realized they were going to have to rebuild everything. Mary decided she needed to leave and go back to Calabar to be with her children. She left the village, knowing they were a changed group of people. During the 10-hour canoe ride back, a storm hit 
and the canoe filled with water, and she was freezing cold by the time she arrived back in Calabar. She became so sick, she almost died. She was rushed to the hospital, but it soon became clear she was going to have to leave Africa and go back to Scotland. Mary had to leave her children, who were being cared for by the villagers, in order to return to Scotland. Once in Scotland, Mary recovered quickly, and on Sundays, she began to speak in churches. Everywhere she went, she would tell people that they need to leave the comfort of their home and go to the mission field. One day, she met a girl named Jessie Hogg. Jessie ended up going to Africa and was there for 13 years. Finally, shortly after Mary's 40th birthday, she was ready to head back to Africa. The people of Calabar were so happy to see Mary, and her children were happy to have her home. She continued preaching and added even more churches. Nearby, there was a village called Koi, and the British soldiers could not enter the village. The other villages in the area were afraid of these people. They were always fighting, and there was constant murder and drinking. Not a single British soldier would dare enter that area. The other villages were even more afraid. Two missionaries tried to move into the village. One was shot and ran away. The other was captured and managed to escape just before he was murdered. Mary decided she was going to move into this village, but it was clearly not safe. Do you love learning about church history and love this podcast? This podcast is being turned into a book series, and the first book is now available for sale. You can find the link in the show notes. And now, back to our episode. One day, the tribe sent a messenger that they wanted the white ma to come and speak to his tribe. The preacher, King Eo, begged Mary not to go. But Mary remembered the verse, Psalm chapter 56. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. I will not be afraid of what men can do unto me. Mary arrived in the village and was met by Chief Eden. Chief Eden was part of the slave trade. He would take prisoners and sell them as slaves. His sister was named Ma. Ma became a Christian and soon became good friends with Mary. The two worked together to save slaves and twin babies. Soon Mary felt it would be safe to bring her family and actually move into the village. Mary left a village and went home to pack and bring her children with her. But when she returned to the village, they were in the middle of a drunken rage. Mary was so angry. Had they learned nothing? One of the little boys in the village named Tiki decided to help Mary clean out her hut. He took a broom and he swept out her hut. The men in the village grabbed Tiki, pulled him into the center of the village, and poured boiling water over his arms. Mary was outraged. She took Tiki into her hut and bandaged his wounds. Then Mary began to preach. She continued to work in the tribe. Her and Ma saved many twins and set captives free so they would not be sold as slaves. One day, a chief named Ojar from another tribe called for Mary. He was sick and he wanted her help. Chief Eden begged Mary not to go. Chief Eden said, that's a terrible tribe. Mary had a hard time not laughing, because that's the same thing people had told her about Chief Eden. But Mary left, and when she arrived in the village, she gave medicine to the sick chief, and helped him, and sat with him, and prayed with him, and read the Bible to him. And eventually, the chief got better, and he asked Mary to stay. Mary said she had to return to her family, but she would send other missionaries to come and live with them. The missionary that came was able to start a church. Mary returned to her village, and this time, Chief Eden had not returned to his old ways. The people really were changing. Mary soon built a house, and a church was being built. One day, Mary heard screaming. She ran outside to see a chief named Nijuri had attacked the tribe. The men in his tribe had been drinking, and they were attacking everyone, even their own people. Everyone was terrified. Mary marched right up to Chief Nijiri and grabbed him by his arm, and led him out of the village. She began to march that chief right out of the village, and she continued to walk, all the warriors along the path, leading them back to their own village. Along the way, she came to a broken banana plant. The men started screaming, Witchcraft! Witchcraft! 
Mary picked up the plant and told the men to stop being little babies. Then the men continued to walk all the way home. It was now 1891. Mary is 43 years old. The people in the area had changed completely. Mary soon took time to go back to Scotland. She traveled, spoke in churches, and she returned as soon as she could. When she got off the boat, she heard people yelling, Run, Ma, run! Two tribes were about to go to war. Mary called the tribes to come, and Mary sat and listened to the two chiefs complain. It seemed that at any moment they could break out and kill each other. The tribes were warring over a piece of land, so Mary took a stick and drew a map of the land in the dirt. She then asked one of the chiefs to draw a line dividing the land. She then asked the other tribal chief to pick what side he wanted. The chiefs did not go to war, and the British were extremely impressed with how Mary was able to keep the peace. One person who was very impressed was a Scotsman named Sir Claude MacDonald, and he came to see Mary. Sir Claude MacDonald told Mary he was going to send soldiers into the tribes where Mary was working. But Mary begged him, please do not send soldiers into this village. That will only lead to war. Sir Claude MacDonald decided that Mary would be placed in charge of the area. So Mary became a vice counsel for Queen Victoria. People came from all around to tell Mary their problems. And Mary would listen and pass judgment. And everyone thought her judgments were fair. The British continued to build towns, roads, and schools. And they wanted the chiefs to give up their authority to the British. But the chiefs did not want to do that. And the ones that refused were exiled to the Indies. In 1807, Chief Obar from Calabar was banned. In 1900, Calabar became the capital of southern Nigeria. Calabar and its people had completely changed. They now valued human life. Ma continued to travel and preach, as well as hear as many complaints as she could. One day, as she was traveling in a canoe, a hippopotamus attacked her canoe. Mary took a frying pan and hit the hippopotamus right in the head. Another time, there was a group of bandits that attacked her home. Mary came out and told the bandits she would feed them with a large home-cooked meal if they would just plaster the walls in the schoolhouse. The bandits went to the schoolhouse, plastered the walls, and then Mary gave them a nice large home-cooked meal. Mary was given a raise from the British, and she was able to use that money to build a bigger house. Things were going really well, until Chief Edom's son died suddenly. Even though the chief had changed a lot over the years, Mary knew this was going to be very bad. The tradition was to kill the son's slaves and his wives. Mary had to convince the chief to change the tradition, that had been held by his culture for thousands of years. Mary convinced Chief Edom to dress his son in a suit and then have a proper burial and celebrate the life of his son. The chief agreed. This was the first funeral for a prince in thousands of years that did not involve human sacrifice. Mary cried at the funeral. She cried for the death of the son that she had loved as well. And she cried for joy to see how much the people had changed. Things were going really well, until smallpox hit. The villagers began getting sick and dying. Mary sent all of her children away, but she stayed to take care of the sick. Mary was trying to take care of each of the sick. When someone died, she would move them to another area of the house. But soon there were so many dead that her whole house was full. Then Chief Eden got sick. Mary tried to save him, but she couldn't. When he died, Mary could not leave him in a room with the other bodies. So all by herself, she built a coffin, dug a grave, and buried Chief Edom, who had become one of her closest friends. The entire village died of smallpox. Mary was found unconscious in her home. She was the only survivor. She was taken, put on a boat, and sent back to Scotland to die. Her home was sealed up with the dead still inside. No one was allowed to enter for any reason. Bushes grew around it. Eventually it rotted and sank into the ground. Everyone thought Mary would die in Scotland, 
but she survived. And once again, she began traveling and preaching, telling everyone they needed more missionaries in Nigeria. In 1902, at the age of 54, Mary returned to Africa. She would never go back to Scotland again. Her mother and her siblings had all died. There was nothing in Scotland for her anymore. Her family, her children, were all in Africa. Many of her children had grown and now had children of their own. Mary arrived back in Africa, and so much had changed since her first arrival in 1870. It was now 26 years later. The British had built railways and trains that traveled across Africa, and this made it easier to get from village to village. The ports had been remade, and they were now large enough for many boats. Many British people were now living in Nigeria, but also the Nigerians had changed. Many Nigerians had traveled to Europe to be educated. There was now Nigerian lawyers, Nigerian engineers, Nigerian pharmacists, and even political leaders. But deep in the jungle, there was tribes that were still following old customs. One tribe was the Arrows. This tribe was still part of the slave trade. They worshipped the devil. They ate human flesh. And one day, the Arrows captured 800 people. All 800 of the people were killed. And then the tribe ate all 800 people. The British sent in 9,000 soldiers to deal with Arrows. Mary was afraid it was going to be a bloodbath. The soldiers entered the village, found skulls, smeared blood on the walls, and then the tribal warriors came out. They told the British, We will talk to you if you bring us the white maw. So, 9,000 soldiers and all the Eros tribes waited to hear what the white maw had to say. Mary spoke first to the Eros. She told them, you can trust the British. They don't want to hurt you. Let them build their roads and the schools and give you medicine. Then she spoke to the British. You must keep your word. You must build the roads and the schools. And you must trade with the Arrows people. But you must trade fairly and give them what they deserve. The Arrows and the British agreed. The Arrows would not kill anymore. And they would follow the laws of the British but only if Mary moved in and lived with them. So she did. A year later, Mary had built a church, and there was 300 people attending regularly. In 1913, a Nigerian prince led a group to Britain to ask for land tenure reform. The Nigerians were taking pride in their country, and they wanted to run it for themselves without the British. On January the 1st, 1914, Southern and Northern Nigeria merged into one country with one flag. They would now simply be known as Nigeria. They became an independent country with their own laws and political parties. The country was completely different than when Mary had first arrived. Mary was now 66 years old. She lived in a charming home with a garden. She couldn't walk anymore. But the people had built her a wheelchair. Her first twin, Jamie, was still with her. That same year was the start of World War I. But Mary did not live through the horrors of two world wars. She died at the age of 66 in 1915. In Nigeria today, there are many reminders of Mary. There are statues of her holding twins. Roads, streets, and hospitals are named after her, not just in Nigeria, but in other cities, including Dundee and Glasgow, have roads named after Mary. There's even an art gallery museum named after her. There are special stained glass windows in memory of Mary. On January the 13th, 2015, on the 100th anniversary of her death, a memorial to Mary was built. I often hear from Christians that the missionaries that colonized Africa were villains rather than heroes, and I wanted to address this as I told the story. I studied the history behind the British takeover of Nigeria and the Nigerians claiming the land back. There's a lot of problems about how the British took control of the land, especially when the chiefs were banned. The early raids in the 15th century that developed the slave trade into the Western nations was very evil, from Satan. Also, while the British gave many good things to the Nigerians, they also stole their resources and made money off of Nigerian resources. This was also very wrong. However, the Christian missionaries, such as Mary Slessor, had a positive impact on the society and ended some cultural practices that were also very wrong. 
But how can I, a Canadian living in Canada with no Nigerian family, how can I have a correct perspective on this? So I decided to ask some Nigerian Christians their thought on this. And this is what they wrote to me. We know that not all missionaries practiced what they preached. We are good with the early missionaries, and they are reverenced here in Nigeria, especially the likes of Mary Slessor, who was even taught about in every school as the person who stopped the killing of twins. The importance of that achievement can never be overemphasized, and that put her on a pinnacle of the elite missionaries that ever set foot in our country. There are other famous missionaries whose statues were built in Nigeria and other parts of this country. The schools and churches they helped build, the orphanages, the hospitals, and the houses, all of which mostly still are in existence today. The many barbaric traditions and laws they helped get rid of are what gave birth to the most developments and achievements we have today. So in general, a lot of Christians hold them in high regard, except for a few which they believe to have been pedophiles, corrupt, and manipulative. So in total, I would say the pros outweighed the cons, as to say they were held and still held in high regards. As to the part of colonization, it is a matter of separating emotion and logic. Some people believe that the missionaries gave us the Bible while they took our resources. Some believe the religion that they taught was a tool for control and a regulation of critical thought. But the average Nigerian Christian who has encountered Jesus Christ thinks differently. They know that without them, it would not have been possible for them to be Christians. So that covers up any lingering doubts about exploitation. With that, they are able to separate the missionaries from the imperialists. Today in Nigeria, the northern part is Muslim and the southern part is Christian. The northern part is where Boko Haram is. It's a group which denies Western education and imposes Sharia law. It has attacked and killed many Christians. Whole villages have been burned to the ground and many people have been murdered. We need to pray for the Christians today in Nigeria. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters who are in northern Nigeria. God did amazing things through Mary Slessor, and he is the same God today. Next week, we're going to talk about Hudson Taylor. If you would like to see more videos, listen to some podcasts, read some blogs, you can check out my website at lauraleesiemens.com. And I'll see you next week. 